أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي الله سبحانه وتعالى ساز القرآن بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يعلم أنما الحياة الدنيا لعب وله وزينة so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says no so the ayah begins in surah al-hadid verse 20 I believe know that the life of this world i'lamu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not telling us to think it is not telling us to um, you know kind of you know know it but know it i'lamu so he is telling us in a very emphatic way a fact so that's why he's saying i'lamu know it as a fact اعلموا أنما الحياة الدنيا اعلموا أنما الحياة الدنيا لعب. So um, when you look at this ayah, it's actually so amazing the order in which Allah Subhanahu wa Taala lists the descriptions of this life. I listened to a lecture a few years ago, and it, it was one of those really major turning points for me. It was kind of an aha moment. And it was a lecture by Shabbat, by Ustad Ma'man Ali Khan, which he talked about this ayah. And what he went on to explain is the order in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses in this, in this description of the life of this world. He begins by saying that the life of this world is lab, is play. Now when you reflect on the lifetime of a human being, at every stage of our life, dunya means something different. So dunya for a child is something, dunya for a adolescent is something else, dunya for a teenager is something else. The focus of what makes up my dunya, the focus of what my life revolves around, it evolves as we grow. What's important to me changes as we grow. What is the, when you're first born and when you're at the beginning entering into this life, what is your dunya about? Play. Your dunya is about play. A child, the whole world, all that really matters to a child is playing. If you want to get a gift for a child, you give them the nicest suit, as the Ustad said, and they couldn't care less. You could have spent a thousand dollars if they even make that. I'm sure they do some, you know, disposable income. Um, a suit for a two-year-old that costs a thousand dollars, is that child going to care? No, because all that a child cares about is toys. If you want to make the child happy, get them a toy, even if it's 99 cents. Because all that matters at that point, dunya is all about play. And then as the child grows up, now we're talking maybe more middle school age. Now the ayah goes on and says, Walahu. Lahu is entertainment, basically. When you get a little bit older, it isn't just about playing with toys, but now it's entertain me. You know, the, the, the most common phrase you hear from a middle schooler is, I'm bored. Right? It's like entertain me, constantly entertain me. I, I can't not be stimulated for two seconds. I need to constantly be stimulated, entertain me. And this is the world we live in, unfortunately. We don't always grow out of it. Then we get older and now we're in high school. Now, what's the most important thing in high school? Well, this is the age where you start to take two hours to get ready in the morning. And you know, it's, you're just like, if there's a reflection, you have to check how's your hair and, and or hijab or whatever. Um, zina. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala next, third in the list is zina. Zina is decoration, adornment. 
looking nice, things being looking nice externally. Then when you're at that stage, you know, the kind of the high, high school or teenage, what's your dunya about? What you look like, what that other person is, looks like. And, um, you know, the status symbols are very important, but here it's, it's about what you're wearing and how you look. And this is your dunya. And then you get a little bit older and you graduate. Now you start to apply for schools, start to apply to different colleges and programs. And now your focus is a little bit different. Once you know you get into college, it's not as important what you're wearing anymore. But now something else is more important. وَتَفَاخُرٌ بَيْنَكُمْ Now it's all about boasting. تَفَاخُرٌ بَيْنَكُمْ means boasting between one another. You know, it's, it's all about uh, what program did I get into? What university did that person get accepted to? Now it's really about showing off. It's no longer about playing with the toys. It's no longer about, you know, the entertainment as much. It's no longer about what I'm wearing as much. Now it's about boasting. Now you're trying to prove yourself to the rest of the world that I am doing this and I am in this program and I have this degree. So you're trying to prove yourself at that point. And there's so much competition. There's so much competition at that point to prove yourself and to boast of your accomplishments. Boasting between one another. Then, you know, you settle down, you get married, and now you have kids. Now what's dunya about? Well, it's no longer relevant what toys you played with when you were a child, or you know, the, the movie theaters and the, you know, the entertainment, or what you wore in high school, or necessarily what program you went to, or what degree you got in college. Now it's about competing in wealth and children. Now it's about what did my child do compared to what did your child do? What university is your child in versus what university is my child in? And how much money am I spending on my child's wedding <laughs> compared to how much you are spending on your child's wedding? And it's this competition now in wealth and children. Now it's about what your house looks like as compared to what someone else's house looks like and what kind of car you're driving. So that becomes your dunya. After telling us that this is, this, is, this is all kind of, we're all at a different stage in this timeline. We sort of fit somewhere in there. Allah is telling us after all of that, He gives us a parable. He says, know that the life of the world, this world is these things in this order. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a parable. You know you have a good teacher if your teacher can explain concepts using a parable that you can relate to. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best teacher and the best murabbi, the best one to raise us. life. <laughs> So here Allah makes a parable. It is like a garden. al kuffar that the the farmer becomes very pleased with it. These things that we listed, our toys and our entertainments and our competition and our boasting, it's it, it it's beautiful for a moment. It's like the example of a flower. When you take a flower and you look at a flower when it's in full bloom, it is, you could almost call it perfect. But there is a sign in the flower because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the signs of Allah is what happens to the flower over time. And it doesn't take long for it to happen. What happens to a flower that you're very pleased with for a moment, someone gives you a flower, you're very pleased for a moment. But what happens over time, it's, it makes the farmer really happy for a moment, but then it starts 
to turn, it starts to wilt, it starts to crumble, it starts to turn yellow. This is the, natu this is the natural life cycle. It starts to turn yellow. Thumma, and then after that, it just becomes like, you know, if you take that flower, the, the flower that used to be perfect, and it, after it dries up and turns yellow, it, it can become hutama, which is just debris. You can take and you can crumble it in your hand. Allah has made a parable. We have to pay attention. Allah is saying that the life of this world is like that. That it is all these things that we run after, different stages of our life. But at the end, what happens? Just like that flower, just like that garden, it blooms, but then it becomes yellow, and then it crumbles away. And at the end, what happens? After that crumbling away happens, all that's left is one of two things. The severe punishment of Allah, or the maghfira and the ridwan, or forgiveness and the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَنْ حَيَاتُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَعَ and what is the life of this world except mata, the deceptive pleasure? I want to take a moment and look at this word mata because I also found it very fascinating when you look at the root of this word. Allah describes this life as a mata, mata al ghurub. It is a mata and it is deceptive, mata of deception. But what is a mata? Well, mata normally is translated as something, pleasure. But if you go to the root of the word mata, this is, this is what I found very fascinating. You find that it is essentially a resource or a tool. And some of the, the teachers, they say that in, you know, the, the old Arabs used to refer to like something like a fork as a mata, it's, it's something you use. But let me ask you this question. If I were to give you a box full of tools, and I tell you that I'm giving you this box full of tools so that you can build a house, how many people are going to open up that box, see the hammer, see the nails, see the screwdriver, and pick out the tool and fall in love with the hammer? and forget what they're supposed to do with it. You pick up a hammer and you just look at it and you're like, wow, look at the shape of that hammer. That is an awesome hammer. And you become so distracted by the shape of the hammer that you forget what the purpose of the hammer is. And what we have done in this life is exactly that. Allah has given us a box of tools, mentam. And the purpose of those tools is for us to build our home in Jannah. But what we do is we take out the hammer, we take out the nail, and we fall in love with the tool and we forget the purpose. We fall in love with the money and we forget the purpose. We fall in love with the people in our life and we forget the purpose. We fall in love with status, we fall in love with wealth, we fall in love with all of, you know, power, and we forget that all of these things are just a tool. We have a destination. This life is the vehicle. It's again like someone who gets in a car. Here we are in, um, you know, near DC. And suppose you want to drive, and I'm from, well, I'm living right now in North Carolina. Suppose that, you know, I want to get, get back to North Carolina and I'm driving. My destination is Raleigh. If I get in the car, the purpose of my getting in the car is what? To take me to Raleigh, to take me to North Carolina. But what happens if I get in the car and I look around and I'm like, wow, look at these leather seats. Wow, look at the steering wheel. 
This is an awesome car. And I become so in love with the car and so distracted by the color and material of the seats that I never even turn it on. What have I done? Have I missed the point? What's the point of the car? It's to take me somewhere. It's a means. But so many of us, we have gotten into the car and we have fallen in love with the seats and fallen in love with the steering wheel that we never even turn it on. And we aren't going anywhere. Dunya is like that car. We are sitting in it so distracted that we aren't moving anywhere because we've forgotten that it's just a means. Your money is a means, your job, your education, your relationships, but we get lost in those things. And so we don't actually move. You know, there is a very powerful statement of Ali Radilan, and it relates to this concept of dunya, because sometimes people in discussing detachment, in discussing how do I not be attached to this life, they take one extreme in which, you know, that, that extreme of complete, um, you know, like, like, like a monk, right? Totally not being involved, not having anything of this life. But this is not the detachment, the zuhud that we are taught by the Prophet Sallallahu and there's a very powerful statement of Ali radiallahu anhu in which he says that zuhd is not that you do not own anything, but that nothing owns you. So it's okay, as the Ustaz said, to own money, but the problem is when the money owns you. It's okay to have these things and to be involved in these things as the Prophet them said. And he gets married, and he, he sleeps some, he prays some, he fasts some, he eats some. But the heart of, of, of the Prophet them was not attached to these things. And there's a very beautiful story of Abu Hanifa, rahmatullah alayhi, that illustrates this. He was a man who owned property. And one time while he was teaching, some people came to him and told him that your ships have sunk, or some portion of your ships have sunk. So this is equivalent to basically someone finding out that they lost a lot of money in the stock market. They just lost a lot. So Abu Hanifa, rahmatullah he pauses for a moment while he's teaching, and then he says, alhamdulillah, and then he continues teaching. And then a little while later, they come back to him and they tell him, actually, no, it wasn't your ships. We made a mistake. Your ships are fine. So again, he pauses and he says, Alhamdulillah, and then he continues teaching. And when he's asked about that, he explains that when I was first told that my ships have sunk, I paused and I examined my heart and I found it unmoved. So I said, Alhamdulillah. And then again, when I was told that it was not my ships, I paused and I examined my heart and I again found it unmoved. And so I said, Alhamdulillah. His, his Alhamdulillah wasn't about the gain or the loss. His Alhamdulillah was about the fact that his heart was not attached to the gain or the loss. This is our problem. It's not that we own or we don't own money. It isn't that we're involved or we're not involved. It isn't that we're in or we're not in relationships. It is that those things own us. See, there's two places that you can hold a gift. All of these are gifts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah gives us wealth, Allah gives us youth, Allah gives us health, Allah gives us intellect, Allah gives us family, and there are two places you can hold any gift. You can hold it in the hand, or you can hold it in the heart. And our problem is when we take the gift and we hold it in our heart. 
There's nothing wrong with having the gift as long as it stays in your hand. So as long as the money is in your hand, as long as the status is in your hand, as long as the relationships with the creation are in your hand, then you're fine. The problem is when they're in your heart. Because the only thing that's supposed to be in the heart is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm gonna clarify what that means because sometimes people get confused. They think, well, wait, but we're supposed to love our families and it's okay to love these things. Yes, absolutely. But when I say what is in the heart, I'm not talking about love. I am talking about absolute dependency. I'm talking about absolute attachments. I'm talking essentially about worship. Our problem is we take the gifts of Allah and we love them more than the giver. And this is a fact. We love the gift more than the giver. We love the money more than the giver. We love the spouse more than the giver. We love the children more than the giver. When we do that, something very painful happens. Anything that you love, as you should only love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, becomes the cause of your greatest pain. And that's how you'll know. And when we look back at the story of Abu Hanifa, rahmatullah his heart was unmoved by the gain or loss of his wealth. But had his heart been attached to those ships, then finding out that they had sunk would have devastated him. This is the problem with having these types of false attachments and loving things as we should only love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is they, they start to control us. If it's a person, then that person starts to control us. If they're pleased with us, if they praise us, then we're good. And if they are not, then we are not able to continue or we break. This is called the orbit of the creation. It's an orbit that has a currency. Every orbit has a currency. You can revolve your life around the creation or you can revolve your life around the creator. And each has its own currency. And you'll notice that the currency of the orbit of the creation is praise and, 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 and losing that is criticism. So that's why we start to covet these things because that's the currency. But the amazing thing about this type of currency is it's like monopoly money. How many people have ever played Monopoly? Probably everyone at some point. Monopoly money feels really good to like be rich for a moment, right? I have a million dollars, I have like 50 houses, I don't, you know, like you feel really good while you're playing the game that I, I have all this money and I have all this property, but what can you buy with Monopoly money? This is, the, this is really the, the way that human praise is. You know, it's like, it's, it's like, like the people are happy with you. Okay, what are you gonna buy with that? The people are praising, or the people are criticizing you. Have you really, what have you really lost? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with you, then what have you lost? And if all the people in the world are praising you and Allah is not pleased with you, then what have you gained? How do you know? when you're holding a gift in the heart instead of the hand. There are certain ways in which you can know. And I'm going to list just a couple things, indications of that. One of them is just ask yourself, what do I think about all day? What occupies my mind most of the day? We're always thinking about something, unless we're like comatose. We're always thinking about something. What do you think about all day? What do you think about while you're praying? We get distracted. What's distracting you in your prayers? What's the first thing you think about when you wake up in the morning? And what's the last thing you think about before you sleep? What keeps you awake at night? What makes you cry? What are you most afraid of losing? What makes you most angry? And what causes you the most pain in your life? 
When you examine these few things, you start to realize a lot of times the answer to all these questions is the same thing, or it's related to the same thing. Oh, it's my job, or it's my children, or it's my spouse, or it's what people think of me. Now, what do these questions tell us about ourselves? These questions tell us what is really filling our hearts. Because so many of us say with our tongues that we love Allah and His Messenger most. But the truth is, we, when you love something, think about it. When you love something, when you're in love, you are always thinking about what you love. You can't be in love with something and not think about it. It's impossible. So when we say, I love Allah most, but we need a reminder on our phone to remind us to remember him, <laughs> there's a problem in my claim of love because Sara doesn't need to put a reminder in her phone to think about Ahmed if she loves him. We have to examine our claim of love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah warns us in the Qur'an, he says, say, if your fathers or your sons or your spouses or your business which you fear decline or your dwellings which you rejoice, you know, we love a nice house. If any of these things, and Allah lists a number of things and note, every single one of them is halal. Every one of them is halal, and in fact, we're supposed to love these things. Our parents, our spouses, doesn't say boyfriend, girlfriend, our spouses, our children, our, our nice houses, our business. If any of these things, أَحَبُّ إِلَيْكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَجِهَادٌ فِي سَبِيلِ فَتَرَبَّصُوا Allah here tells us that He's telling the Prophet ﷺ to tell us that if any of these things are more beloved to you than Allah and His Messenger and striving in His cause, then just wait. Now this is to me very scary. Because you know when your mom wants to threaten you? You did something wrong? And sometimes she'll be like, um, if you don't stop doing this, you're going to have this punishment. And it's specific. You can kind of handle that. But if she really wants to threaten you, she'll say, just wait and see. <laughs> just wait and see what happens. Allah is telling us, and Allah is high above any analogy, just wait and see. If you love any of these things, which are all halal to love, more than Allah and His Messenger in striving in His cause, then just wait and see. Because the pain of that love will come in this life before the next life, I guarantee it. And it will be that very thing that you love as you should only love Allah that will be the cause of your greatest pain. Because I asked you what you think about most all day, and I asked you what makes you cry, and I asked you what's the greatest cause of your pain, and what's the cause of your anxiety, and what's the cause of your fear, and it's all that same thing that you love as you should only love Allah. The question then is, well, then what? I realize this now. Well, actually, what do I think about most? It has nothing to do with Allah and His Messenger and striving in His cause. It's, it's my job. It's my money. It's my house. It's my car. It's my children. It's my spouse. So now what? What do I do? What's the solution? And I think that to talk about the solution, I'm going to give you an example. When you're a child, you know, a child watching TV and sees a commercial, and on the commercial there's, a, there's an, uh, an advertisement for a toy Ferrari. When a child sees that advertisement, that kid falls in love with that toy Ferrari. 
and every day asks his parents to buy him that Ferrari. If eventually he gets the car, he will not want to let it go. Try taking that car out of the hand of that child. It will not be pretty. It won't be easy. But as that child grows up, now imagine that the child sees a real Ferrari. Now, what happens to his love for the toy Ferrari? Now, when you try to take that Ferrari away, it's much easier because he sees the real thing. What is our problem? Why is it that we are so attached to this life? We are so attached to the toy car because we haven't seen the real car. That's the reason. We love this life so much and are not willing to sacrifice even a little bit because we haven't seen the real car. And we're so attached to the creation because we haven't really seen the creator. We have not measured or estimated Allah his true measure or estimation. We don't really know Allah. Because if we really knew who Allah was, if we really read his words and reflected on them, if we really talked to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every day, like we talk to our friends and we talk to our spouses and our children, then there would be no competition. When you're on your way to meet a king and you see the servant of the king, yes, you know, you say salam to the servant. But how much effort are you going to put into impressing the servant and seeking help from the servant and seeking praise from the servant and seeking love from the servant that you forget about the king? You don't do that because you know who has the power and you know that you're on your way to meet the king. So you treat the servant respectfully but you, your focus is on the king. We're all servants. We're all servants on our way to meet the same king. But we have to be able to see that. Without seeing the real car, you won't let go of the toy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when talking about the hereafter, he asks us a very important question. Do you prefer the life of this world when the hereafter is it is better and more lasting? See, there is dunya, which is the lesser life. It is the toy car. It is that... It is that means, it is that vehicle, it's that box of tools. But there is a higher life. And Allah is asking us, do you prefer this life when the hereafter is better and more lasting? What is it about this life that hurts us? It's two things. One is it's never perfect. No matter what you do, you can never make it perfect. No matter how much money you have, no matter how much status, no matter how much power or beauty or wealth, you can never make it perfect. And second, it doesn't last. No matter how much money you have and how much plastic surgery you, you, know, <laughs> you pay for, you will never make it last forever. You cannot, no matter what you do, make the rose not wilt eventually. Your skin is always going to wrinkle, no matter how much Botox you use. These are signs. Allah is telling us that the hereafter, how do we prefer this life when the hereafter is better and more lasting? It is better in quality, it is perfect, and it is better in quantity. It lasts forever, it doesn't end. We don't have to worry about getting old or wrinkled. We don't have to worry about the two things that people suffer from most in this life. 
Hazen. There is no fear on them, nor will they grieve. What are the two things that we suffer from most? Anxiety and depression, fear and sadness. And it is those two things Allah says when describing Jannah, there is no fear and there is no sadness. But yet, we're still holding on to the toy car. When Allah describes the hereafter, He says, Al-Hayawan. It is not just haya. This life is haya. Haya to the dunya. This life is, is the lesser life. Hayawan in Arabic, this word. It is not just life, but an exaggerated form of life. It is the real thing. Allah is telling us there is the lesser thing, dunya, that which is lower, and there is the real thing, that which is higher, and that's akhirah. We need to start focusing and seeing the real thing. And when we do that, it becomes easy to let go of the toy car. It will become easy now to give up the haram. It will become easier to hold on to Fajr on time and Qiyam and Quran and living those things because we see the real thing and we know our destination. We're not just sitting in the car and forget to turn it on. Finally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm going to end with this because I think it's so comforting. Allah tells us, بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الإنسان إنك كادح إلى ربك كدحا فملاقي Here's the good news. Allah says, O mankind, you are toiling, ever painfully toiling towards your Lord, but you shall meet him.